Hello everyone, so today we're doing a lecture on the pros and cons of our TH1 T helper T cells and we'll be looking at the roles of the TH1 cells in cell mediated immunity, their role in cytotoxic T cell activity, TH1 cell interactions with macrophages, and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions, which TH1 are involved with. So a little bit of refresher from our last lecture on T cells, so you guys can go back and look at that. But again, we're focusing on CD4, and we'll have a lecture on TH2 as well. So just a reminder, we have our CD8 cytotoxic T cells, which we mentioned before, our TFH, which are our T follicular helper cells. I'm not going into too much detail, but just a little reminder. These T follicular helper cells are important for B cell help and promote antibody promotion and class switching. And then again, we have our different subsets, TH1, which promotes cell mediated immunity, TH2, which promote antibody production, usually IgE, see that here, then our TH17, which are pro-inflammatory, and our Tregs, which have a regulatory role. So again, check our last lecture for a recap on this in a little bit more detail. So again, our cytokines, we have our several different types of cytokines, which direct CD4 positive T cell differentiation into different effector subsets. So we have these signals, this signal three, which remember we are T cell and our APC has first two signals. So we have for one, which is our T cell receptor, two is our co-stimulatory receptors, and three is our cytokines. So again, here we have the cytokines that will stimulate the different types of T cell subsets. And again, we'll focus on TH1 today. So importantly, we have IL-12 and interferon gamma, which activate T-bet, which induces TH1 cells, which were released further IL-2, IL-2 and interferon gamma. So again, here we can see they're controlled by the different cytokines. So here we have IL-12, which is the main one. So our CD4 positive effector T cells specialize in different actions that allow them to control the immune system. Infections caused by intracellular pathogens tend to induce interferon gamma and IL-12, and this promotes Th1 differentiation and action. So, Th1 cells are active in promoting cell-mediated immunity. Actions of Th1. So, Th1 cells, again, release interferon gamma and IL-2. They promote CMI, or cell-mediated immunity. There's the activation of our APCs, our CDLs, our phagocytes, and as well as our NK cells. And yes, they can be influenced by B cells. So, interferon gamma is a switch factor for certain immunoglobulin G subclasses. So, interferon gamma released from TH1 cells can influence B cells to go to IgG1 or IgG3 in humans, and promote which promote opsonization and complement fixation. So here we have our example, we have our naive T cell, proliferating T cell, an immature effector cell. So again, here's the differences between going to a TH1 to a TH2. So in this case, we have differentiation into TH1 is promoted by IL-12, which we said. This TH1 cell can then release IL-2 and interferon gamma, resulting in macrophage activation, B cell activation, and the production and of opsonizing antibodies such as IgG1. We also have T follicular helper cells, which also produce interferon gamma and drive class switching by B cells to IgG1 and IgG3. So why do we need cell-mediated immunity? So cell-mediated immunity is a combination of innate and adaptive immunity activity and is carried out by cells, mainly T cells and phagocytes. So the products of adaptive immunity can enhance activity of innate cells. So for example, if TH1 cells can activate macrophages and NK cells. TH1s can also, be, can also activate CDLs and the CDL and B cells also act to promote production of opsonizing antibody to enhance phagocytosis. So in comparison, Th2 cells interact with B cells, but are usually not part of the cell-mediated immunity picture. So here, we can see here, we have cytosolic T cells travel to the infected tissue, where the virus infected cells present specific antigen. So virus infected cells die by apoptosis by the CDLs. Effector Th1 cells travel to infected tissue, where macrophages infected with or containing the bacteria present present specific antigen. So again, as in pre antigen presentation, then we see our activated macrophages kill the bacteria. 
And then here we have our TH2, for example. So cell-mediated immunity is responses involving many cells. So the key participants are the TH1 and CD4-positive CD4 TH1 cells, our CDLs, which are CDA-positive T cells, our FEG6 cells, including macrophages and neutrophils, and our NK cells. The key goal here is dealing with intracellular pathogens. That's one of the main functions, TH1 and intracellular pathogens. So T helper cells provide cytokines to assist in macrophage activation, and CDLs can kill altered self cell self cells such as virus infected cells. So again, we have our TH1 cell releasing cytokines with our co-stimulator signal binding as well as our T cell receptor. These T cells secrete effector molecules onto the surface, as we see. So we have our cytokines. Here, and then we also have CD8 T cells working at the same time, which release these as well. So innate interactions of the CDL with targets are nonspecific. So these cell adhesion molecules mediate initial binding. So we've seen these before. We've seen our integrins in our ICAMs. So LFA1 on the T cell interacts with ICAM on the target cell. This T cell scans for surface, scans the surface for peptide MSC complex that it recognizes. If it's the wrong target, the T cell will detach and move on and scan targets until it matches. When we have correct target recognition, there will be signaling through the T cell receptor, resulting in increased affinity of the adhesion molecule, of adhesion molecule interactions, and this prolongs the contact between the CDL and the target, allowing for action to place, take place. So here we see the initial interaction with CD8 cell target is made by nonspecific adhesion molecules, which include LFA. LFA1 to ICAM. So if there's no interaction, it continues and separates. But if there's an antigen-specific reaction, there will be stable pairing and focused release of effector molecules to kill the cell. So CDLs now, this cytotoxic T lymphocyte will now deliver its effector molecules once it's bound and in a stable position, once we have the stable pairing. This causes target cell death, causing apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. This CDL will then detach and moves on and is searched for another target. So this one CDL can kill multiple cells. So here it attaches. We have death of the target cell and the release of CD8 T cell. Again, it can re recognize and bind to another virus infected cell. The CDL programs the target for cell death, inducing DNA frag fragmentation. And then again, migrates to a new target and the target cell dies by apoptosis. We can see it here. So here we can essentially see a cell dying by apoptosis. So cytotoxic T cells are selective and serial killers of targets expressing a specific antigen. So we can see that the cytotoxic T cells have certain protein granules in their, of the cytotoxic T cells. So we have our perforin, granzymes, and granulysin. So perforin aids in delivering contents of granules into the cytoplasm of the target where granzymes are serine proteases, which activate apoptosis. So these kind of, these act in delivering the granzymes, essentially, activate apoptosis, and then granzymes, once they're in the cytoplasm of the target, they induce this apoptosis. Then we have granulysin, which has antimicrobial actions and can induce apoptosis. Our CD8 T cell effector proteins that trigger apoptosis are contained in the granules. So essentially what we can see here is that the granules are moving in to the cell. And then here we can see the cells essentially dying. So granule release is random, it is targeted. So CDLs become polarized when they recognize their target cells. This allows focused delivery of effector molecules, like we said, like a granzymes. And these are released toward the cell, and these move toward the cell target. So here we can see in this picture, we have collision with a non-specific adhesion, like we said with LFA and ICAM. Specific recognition redistributes the cytoskeleton and cytoplasm components of the T cell. So this is key here. We can actually see how the cell is rearranged. So we can see how the different components of the cell are rearranged to allow for distribution of the granules. And then we release the granules at the site of cell contact. T cell receptor binding to the target cell causes cytoskeletal reorganization. So these proteins stored in the CDL granules are now aimed at the target cell. 
So you see here, they're now moved and aimed. So in this photograph here, we can see in green, we have microtubule skeleton. In the red, the cytotoxic granules. We can see dispersed granules at the top. See the little red dots all over the place. And then we can see they've all moved to, the, to be aimed at the target cell. And here, just so you know, mTOC, we can see right here, mTOC is microtubule organizing center, and this aligns the CDL secretory apparatus, which is the Golgi apparatus, toward the target cell. So cell median immunity is most important, again, with dealing with intracellular pathogens, including some bacteria. So again, our key cells, Th1, CTLs, and our phagocytes, including macrophage and neutrophils and NK cells. And again, the key goal is intracellular pathogens. But they also important in virus infected cells as well. So Th1 cell interactions promote and coordinate cell mediated immunity. And here's well, here we're going to discuss our Th1 cell interactions with macrophages. Oops, sorry. Functions of the intracellular bacteria. So so initially, we can have our Th1 cells, which produce interferon gamma and CD40L, which induce and activate M1 macrophages. So here we can see your interferon gamma and CD40L. This will enhance my macrophage killing of engulfed bacteria. We can have fast ligand and leukotriene beta, which produced by Th1 cells to induce apoptosis of bacteria-laden macrophages. So these are ones that are actually infected. This kills chronically infected cells, releasing bacteria to be destroyed by fresh macrophages. We also have IL-2 produced by Th1 cells that acts on naive CD4 and CD8 cells. So here we can see our IL-2. This alters the balance of Th1 versus T follicular helper differentiation to favor Th1, and this supports expansion of the CD8 CDLs. IL-3 and granulocyte macrophagy colonnade stimulating factor, or GMCSF, produced by Th1 cells, stimulate the production of monocytes. So here's our IL-3 and GMCSF. This induces monocyte differentiation in the bone marrow. So again, these are just, there's so many functions of the TH1 cells that are vitally important in our immune response. So again, we have TH1 cells produce into TNF alpha and leukotriene alpha, which act on blood vessels. And this allows for greater diapodesis. This activates the endothelium to induce macrophage binding and exit from blood vessels outside infection. We have chemokines such as CCL2, which induced by TH1 cells which is a chemoattractant for monocytes. See our cytokines attracting functioning chemotaxis, and this causes macrophages to accumulate at the site of infection. So Th1 cells produce interferon gamma IL-2 and other cytokines that promote activity of macrophages in, a bunch of, in all these ways here, and other T cells, including CDL and NK cells and neutrophils. So macrophage activation by Th1 cell. So bacteria engulfed by a macrophage process antigen presented by class 2 MHC. Antigen-specific Th1 cells bind peptide MHC class 2 complex on the macrophage, and this means the Th1 cell will be activated. This stimulus is delivered through the T-cell receptor CD3 complex and CD28, which is our co-stimulatory molecule, which we talked about in our T-cell lecture. Now the Th1 cell can return the favor, and this activates the macrophage. We have our co-stimulatory molecules and cytokines, so we have our CD40L, on the Th1, which binds to CD40 on the macrophage. Then our Th1 cell secretes interferon gamma, and this binds interferon gamma receptors on the macrophage, and the outcome is a further macrophage activation. So you see here, our interferon gamma and our CD40, interferon gamma receptor, and our CD40 ligand. Th1 cells have a central role in macrophage activation, so that's key. Macrophages need two signals two signals to become fully activated. This is delivered by interferon gamma and CD40 to CD40L interaction, and Th1 can deliver both of these signals. So it's extremely effective at dealing with activating macrophages. So these activated macrophages are not just more present, I guess, in infection, they're actually more effective than they would be without Th1. So these activated macrophages, so the result of this is activated macrophages are more effective at dealing with pathogens. You can go to this link here if you want to see an animation. 
So these products of the activated macrophages are what we see up here. So you have the activation of macrophages by Th1 cells, promotes microbial killing, and must be tightly regulated to avoid tissue damage. So you can see there's so many different things really in these. IL-12, TNF-alpha, nitric oxide, IL-12, and then we have our different receptors for CD40, MHC1, 2, and our B7 molecules. So why are some pathogens best dealt with by Th1 in cell-mediated immunity? So here's an example of a thing that happened not too long ago in Canada. It was a huge beef recall in Canada. So this was because there was a bacteria that caused intracellular infection. This was Listeria monocytogenes. We have Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae. These are all viruses. So again, there was a virus infection in these food or intracellular bacteria that caused a lot of infections. So this Th1 response resulted in a continued tuberculoid infection when we're looking at Mycobacterium leprae. So how do we deal with these intracellular pathogens? And then we'll talk about this. So it can cause a contained tuberculoid infection and the production of IL-2 and interferon gamma. A Th2 response resulted in disseminated lepromatose infection with the production of IL-4 and IL-10. So essentially this is pointing out that these are different pathogens and the fact that with a Th2 response and Th1 response, we clearly have different results. So this was effective against the other one while not being effective against the other. So example, cytokine profiles of different responses to M. leprae, which is the cause of leprosy. So a Th1 cytokine profile on the left can contain the infection, so I actually dealt with it. We can see here. And LT, just so you guys remember, is a lymphotoxin. In contrast, our Th2 cells had a Th2 cytokine profile on the right, we had disseminated infection. So we can see here, lots of infection. So now, continuing the leprae. So again, this Th2 response contained the tuberculoid infection with the promotion of IL-2 and interferon gamma. This results in macrophage activation and better killing of the intracellular M. leprae and localizes the infection. With a Th2 response, we had a disseminated or lepromatose infection with IL-4 and IL-10. So the virus or bacteria grows in the macrophages and is stuffed with bacteria and it spreads throughout the body. This damages the skin, cartilage, bones, organs, and nerves. So here we can see we have an infection with Mycobacterium leprae, which results in clinical forms of leprosy. So there are two polar forms, tuberculoid and lepromatose leprosy, but several intermediate forms exist. So in our tuberculoid, we have an effective Th1 response, which kind of keeps the uh, infection localized. So again, we have low infectivity, essentially have a granulose, granulomas formed and local inflammation and some peripheral nerve damage, normal serum Ig levels, and normal T cell responses. And this is when we have our Th1. So some people can be more predisposed to have one or the other. So some, for example, someone had a Th2 response, shows florid growth, high infectivity, disseminated infection, hypergamma globinemia, and lower absent T-cell responsiveness. So this is not good. And this is all just through which pathway, Th1 or Th2 did. So this is why it's so important to know that our body can actually decide when it's more appropriate to use one or the other. But it's not always the case. There can be errors. So now looking at mycobacterium tuberculosis. So mycobacterium tuberculosis has an acid fast cell wall, which is lipid rich mycolytic acid layer. So mycobacterium tuberculosis can cause chronic lung infections with inflammation and can spread to other locations, such as the CNS causing meningitis infecting the brain. Its key virulence feature is its ability to grow inside macrophages. So it's actually growing inside of our immune cells. By doing this, it blocks phagolysosome fusion and impairs macrophage ability to clear infection. So here's, I believe, is a scan of the lungs. Yeah, this can do a lot of damage. You've probably heard of tuberculosis before. So you can here see we have necrosis, ruptured tubercle, which can then spread. So now we'll look at Th1 activity with M tuberculosis. So again, Th1 activity results in macrophage inflammation and causes inflammation and tissue damage. 
This localized inflammatory response develops granulomas. So here we have a granuloma, which essentially contains the virus in a giant pool of T-cells, essentially. So this granuloma has a central core of infected macrophages surrounded by T-cells. These are formed to prevent the spread of bacteria. And these mycobacterium tuberculosis can persist inside the granuloma for pretty much a long time. So these granulomas are organized collections of macrophages surrounded by activated lymphocytes. Fused macrophages form giant cells in the center, but this M. tuberculosis can remain latent. And as you know, there's certain infections such as like herpes that kind of can happen like this, and then they can become reactivated, and then re-contained, and then again and again. So failure to clear tuberculosis. So macrophage-derived cytokines stimulate inflammation in tissue remodeling. Chemokines and other cytokines can help with collagen synthesis and deposition, and this can help form the granulomas in the fibrous tissue. Normal host tissue is replaced with a fibrous scar tissue, and we can have lung damage and tuberculosis. So this is essentially why someone who gets tuberculosis usually comes out with some sort of poor lung prognosis. So even though we have this response, this inflammation and tissue remodeling that occurs actually damages the lung, similar to what we see in COVID. So these granulomas will for form to wall off an area of infection and inflammation. Our macrophage-derived cytokines like TNF, IL-1, TGF-beta, and chemokines help form a granuloma and fibrous tissue formation. So again, our Th1 activity leads to host damage, but a lack of Th1 activity is way worse because then it goes unchecked. So if this immune system loses the stalemate, so here essentially we were keeping it in that granuloma, we had it under control, then something happens and now it can escape. So a secondary or reactivated tuberculosis results when the M tuberculosis ruptures in the tubercules and ruptures the tubercules and resumes active infection. This spreads through the lungs via the bronchioles. Reactivated TB is common in TB infected individuals with suppressed immune systems when cell mediated immunity fails. Disseminated TB can result if macrophages spread the bacteria throughout the body to the bone marrow, spinal cord, kidneys, and the brain. So yeah, it can be not good. So why is mycobacterium so bad or so difficult? So several violent strategies allow survival inside macrophages. They block fecal lysosome fusion, decrease oxidative burst ability, decrease IL-12 production, so there's lower Th1 response. The cell wall components inhibit cell activation, and it may increase T regulatory cells, which we talked about, which downregulate the immune response. And the growth of M tuberculosis is inhibited by activated macrophages. But M tuberculosis can remain latent for years in granulomas and can be reactivated if the immune system is suppressed. So we can be have it for this is why we get that TB test to know that it's, it can be latent. And again, it can affect other people. So essentially, we want to see if we have a latent infection. Essentially, then we'll be constantly checking that person to see if they become immunosuppressed. So, get a sample, you're immunosuppressed, now you got some other illness that affects your immune system. There's a chance that you could, through your other sickness, you could activate TB and get sick from tuberculosis. So again, Th1 cells promote and coordinate cell-mediated immunity. Key mediators, the key, these Th1 cells produce the key cytokines of interferon gamma, IL-2, and other cytokines. But these are the most important ones. So again, here's a really good figure to go through everything. They promote activity of macrophages, other T-cells, including CDLs, NK cells, and neutrophils. Sorry. So again, they can produce interferon gamma and CD40 ligand to activate macrophages and destroy engulf bacteria. Produce fast ligand and lymphotoxin, which kill chronically infected macrophages. IL-2 to induce T-cell proliferation. IL-3 GM-CSF, induce macrophage differentiation in the bone marrow. And again, TNF-alpha and then chemokine CXCL2. So what do all these conditions have in common? So we see different things here, poison ivy in spring, summer, and fall. They all have in common that they're delayed type hypersensitive reactions which is a negative outcome of Th1 cell activity or cell-mated immunity. So, type 4 hypersensitivity reactions. T cells function by making contact with other cells and inducing them to change, as we discussed. So here we have our CD4, it can affect our CD4 positive T cells, can affect our B cells, can affect our macrophages, or the virus-affected cell themselves. So just keep that in mind. 
So we'll go through these eventually through our lectures, but we're going to look at type 4 right now and mainly at the TH1's response. So when TH1 responses go wrong, the antigen presented by tissue macrophages stimulates specific TH1 cells, and this causes a cytokine release and results in macrophages and recruits macrophages to the site, and this recruits more APCs. This amplifies the response, so local blood vessels are affected through cytokines release, including TNF-alpha and lymphotriene alpha, and macrophage activity is stimulated by interferon gamma. This can cause lesions, blistering, and itching. Essentially, so we have all these cells go to there at once. These affect the vessels to allow for more cells to come, and then these macrophages stimulate each other in kind of like a continuous process. So the delayed type hypersensitivity response or type 4 in this case, is directed by cytokines released by antigen-stimulated TH1 cells. So antigen is processed by tissue macrophages. So in case of poison ivy, we'd have a antigen from the, the plant that's located in the skin. Then we have our TH1 cells activated by these macrophages located in, the, in that area. They release chemokines, cytokines, and cytotoxins. So we have our chemokines, which can recruit macrophages and other leukocytes to this antigen deposition, interferon gamma, which induces expression of vascular adhesion molecules, activates macrophages, increasing release of inflammatory mediators, TNF-alpha and lymphotriene, which cause local tissue destruction, which cooperate with interferon gamma to increase expansion of adhesion molecules on local blood vessels, and IL-3 and GM-CSF GM stimulate monocyte production in the bone marrow. So all these are happening, and again, if it's in our skin, Let's just say the antigens in our skin through poison ivy, all this stuff is coming up to that insight to cause a huge inflammatory reaction. So now we're going to look at the stages of delayed type hypersensitivity. So here is kind of just like a skin. So again, use the poison ivy example. So step one, our APCs process and present the antigen. So for example, antigen is injected into the subcutaneous tissue and processed by local antigen presenting cells. So in this campbell, we usually, a lot of studies will inject a little bit of LPS or phytohemagglutinin or some other stuff to essentially test the immune response, but this could also occur in our poison IV example for it. So a second phase, our TH1 cells are primed by the previous exposure to the antigen, and these migrate to the site of antigen become activated. There's a low frequency of antigen-specific cells, there's little inflammation, and slow, it's a slow process. As we can see here is our timeline. TH1 cells release cytokines, and these activate endothelial cells and recruit macrophages. Fluid and protein accumulate and can have visible swelling. So essentially, first phase, antigen uptake, processing, and presentation. Second phase, prime TH1 cells migrate to the site, are activated and release their mediators, and attract and allow macrophage to enter the site. So here, next, we have a TH1 effector cells recognize antigen and release cytokines, which act on vascular endothelium. And then we slowly have this buildup of inflammatory mediators and cells where we have a recruitment of phagocytes and plasma cells to the site of antigen infection, which causes visible lesion. So like we saw, the swelling, blistering, etc. So types of type 4 reactions. So a practical application here is our tuber tuberculosin test, as I mentioned. So tuberculin is from mycobacterium tuberculosis and it's extra intradermally, which you might have had this test before. So tuberculin is made of peptides and carbohydrates. It is used to test for exposure to tuberculosis. It essentially checks if you have an infection or, immune, or immunization with BCG vaccine will result in a positive response. So what happens if there's a positive reaction? So if a lesion appears one to three days due to the monoclonal infiltrates, like we said, we have this time frame. That's why you take it, go home, and then come back. These TH1 cells responding to bursulin release inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma, and these result in changes in blood vessel endothelium, and this increased endothelial permeability and adhesion molecule expression. Macrophages and lymphocytes then enter the site and cause that visible swelling and redness that you see if you're positive. So in tuberculosis, we have a continuous macrophage activation forming granulomas causing tissue damage. So again, Here's a histologic picture showing the dermal mononuclear cell infiltrate after a Mantos test, which is essentially our tuberculin test. The response appears one to two days after injection, producing a red, raised red area of the skin. So you can see. 
So why does poison ivy cause DTH response? So poison ivy essentially contains contact sensitizing agents such as catechols that are in poison ivy are highly reactive molecules that readily penetrate the skin and bind to endogenous proteins. And these are taken up and processed by APCs in the skin, which are essentially our Langerhans cells, which are macrophages in the skin, our dendritic cells, sorry. These are dendritic cells. And these are presented to Th1 cells. So if we're previously primed by the by poison ivy, the Th1 will secrete interferon gamma, stimulate keratinocytes to secrete chemokines, cytokines. This will chemoattract macrophages and induce activation. The products will be intense inflammation. So here, our contact sensitizing agent penetrates the skin and binds to self proteins. So here we can see them entering the skin. Here's our proteins, so it makes them highly antigenic. And these are taken up by our Langerhans cells, our dendritic cells in the skin. These Langerhans cells present self peptides to haptonated with the contact sensitizing agent to the Th1 cells, which secrete interferon gamma and other cytokines. Activated keratinocytes secrete cytokines such as IL-1, TNF-alpha, and chemokines such as IL-8, CXCL11, and CXCL9. Here we can see a bunch of the mediators. And the products of these keratinocytes and Th1 cells activate the macrophages to secrete mediators of inflammation, such as nitric oxide, TNF-alpha, and IL-1. So there are several examples of misguided Th1 activity. So here's a different kind of types. We have our delayed type of sensitivity. So antigens include insects, venom, depression in the, pr the promen. So usually we have local skin swelling, erythema, and duration, cellular infiltrate, and dermatitis. Contact hypersensitivity, which include haptins, which is the catechols we talked about, poison ivy, DNFB, and also some small metal ions like nickel and chromate. These cause local epidermal reactions, erythema, cellular infiltrate, vas vesicules, and intraepidermal intra abscesses. We also have an example here of gluten sensitivity, enteropathy, or celiac disease, which caused by gliadin, which can cause a villous atrophy in the small bowel and malabsorption. So in celiac disease, the type 4 hypersensitivity response to whole wheat protein gliadin, like we said, can contribute to the syndrome of gluten intolerance. So not are these involved in some more, I guess you could say reactive stuff, they're also involved in some autoimmune diseases. So again, some common autoimmune diseases classified by immunopathogenic mechanism. So we can have type 4 T-cell mediated disease. So example, type 1 diabetes. So our autoantigen is the pancreatic beta cell antigens, causing beta cell destruction. Rheumatoid arthritis, synovial joint antigen, joint inflammation destruction, MS, our myelic basin proteins, the results in brain invasion of CD4 T cells, muscle weakness, and neurological symptoms. Crohn's disease, intestinal microbiota is targeted, where we have intestinal inflammation and scarring, and psoriasis, some sort of skin antigen, and inflammation of the skin and formation of plaques. So again, whoops. So here's a summary. We have our Th1 cells. Here are their main functions. That's just targeted. So again, CD4 positive Th1 cells are active in promoting cell mediated immunity, which is essentially their form role. And the cell mediated immunity is usually in a positive manner, but as you saw, it can be involved in some diseases and usually needs to be suppressed. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Next lecture, we'll be taking a look at Th2. So see you then.